<clears throat> we would like to introduce our project uh, called uh, High Efficiency High Temperature Heat Pumps with Temperature Glide. My name is uh, Dennis Voskosch, as Leah said, and I'm from the Lab of Energy and Process Systems Engineering at ETH Zurich, headed by uh, Andre Bardo. And later I will hand over to my uh, colleague, Leon Brandl, and uh, <clears throat> he will uh, uh, show the first experimental results. And he's from the Institute for Energy Systems at uh, Eastern Swiss University of Applied Science. And uh, this institute is headed by uh, Stefan Bertsch. So the uh, so the, you, you might have noticed this is a joint project uh, of ETH and the Eastern Swiss University. And yeah, we have teamed up to work on, on this project, uh, high, high efficiency, high temperature heat pumps with temperature glide. And uh, it's a funded project funded by the SNF and Inno Swiss as part of uh, the bridge uh, funding scheme. And the project has started in April 22, and it uh, runs until April 26. So uh, we are almost at, uh, at half time. And yeah, these are the people uh, who are working on the project. So the project is, is more or has been motivated by the fact that energy transition is uh, mainly a heat transition and that with open challenges that have to be tackled. So the majority of uh, final energy uh, used in the domestic and the industrial sectors uh, is dedicated to heat purposes, yeah? from space heating to water heating uh, to process heating. And yeah, we already found an appropriate solution for uh, space and water heating. Heat pumps can and will play uh, the, the major role in decarbonizing these uh, purposes. But what about process heat? The majority of process heat is still produced based on uh, fossil fuels. However, we know, for example, from uh, energy system studies that a large part uh, of this uh, could also be covered by heat pumps. But there are some challenges and up to now there has been much discussion on implementing high temperature heat pumps, but little has happened. And uh, so first, what's the, what's the current state and of high temperature heat pumps and what are maybe barriers? So various manufacturers have developed high temperature heat pumps, but currently we only have a few demonstrators in the operational environment. The TRL uh, is maybe between uh, five uh, and seven. And yeah, what, what is so, uh, so challenging? Uh, one of the major problems is that each product is currently tailored to exactly one ex uh, application. And this requires, this often requires costly plant engineering. And we see uh, when we have a look at the uh, products, the available products that there's still potential for increasing the efficiency, but also for increasing the maximum temperature. And these points uh, hamper us efficient uh, commercialization. But, uh, and, and to discuss the, the special challenges of high temperature heat pumps, I would like to start with, uh, with domestic heat pumps. So a heat pump usually works between a heat source here in blue and a, uh, and a heat sink here in red. And uh, in the domestic uh, uh, heat pump field, uh, sources can be brine or groundwater or the air. And uh, the sink usually is our house or our flat. And the conditions of the heat sources and sinks are well defined. We uh, well know the temperature levels and they might vary uh, depending on the, or if we have brine or air or whatever, but uh, they are in a very close range. And, uh, and then we can design standardized processes with, uh, with very small losses. Here for the experts here, the ISO bars of the pure refrigerants well fit the temperature uh, changes of sink and source. And uh, we have only small losses the losses are indicated or one 
part of the losses of the heat pump can be indicated by this uh, hedged area. So the situation is totally different for the industry. Their needs are uh, many and varied. And yeah, depending on the application, uh, we can in principle connect any point on the left with any higher point on the right hand side. And that for the heat sink, but also for the heat source. For example, I will give a few examples. Uh, if we uh, consider a drying process, maybe, then we would like to heat up air from a low or medium temperature to a very high temperature. And other uh, applications maybe require thermal oil that is heated up uh, from a medium temperature to a higher temperature, or uh, we need steam. Yeah, And the same uh, uh, applies also for the heat source, uh, sometimes uh, is ambient heat is heat, ambient heat is used, for example, river water or whatever. This could be this line, but uh, in in many cases, waste heat is available, and that can be flue gases or also uh, uh, oil or water, or it could also be steam. Yeah, and uh, the problem is that uh, if we would like to design an efficient and working process for uh, for these heat sources and sinks nearly each application needs a specific uh, refrigerant. And that comes with much effort in development and engineering. And this variability makes standardization uh, and cost-effective commercialization of high temperature heat pumps difficult. So our solution to that is the use of uh, refrigerant mixers with temperature glide. And here uh, you currently see only the TH plot of the pure refrigerant A and a range of uh, possible heat sources and sinks. So sources in blue and sinks in, uh, in red. And we see this process can only efficiently work with a few of the sources and sinks, maybe uh, these one here, ones here. And when I now start the animation, you see how the process uh, evolves when we increase or when we add refrigerant B uh, to refrigerant A and when we increase the share of refrigerant B. And that is how it looked like. And we see from pure A to pure B, the process goes to higher temperatures. And uh, so we can uh, work with other heat sources and things. And in between the pure refrigerant, uh, in between the pure refrigerants, we have a mixture dependent temperature glide. And that can be seen here uh, by uh, the phase change lines like this. They are no longer uh, either thermal uh, in the mixture, they uh, change their temperature. And this is called the temperature glide. And this can be tailored to uh, the heat sink and source and improve efficiency, uh, in particular when the temperature change of sink and source uh, are large, what is often the case for industrial applications. So if you uh, imagine we put a process like this with the either uh, thermal condensation to this uh, heat source, we would end up with a very large hatched area. But if we take a mixture uh, where this line is not a horizontal line, we can tailor it to this uh, shape here and uh, reduce the area of the hatched line. And so we can increase efficiency. Okay, so that means by using mixtures and by tailoring it, we can increase efficiency, but we can also uh, increase flexibility and standardization. Yeah, because the idea is uh, that one product uh, engineered for one binary mixture can be efficiently used for many applications only by tailoring uh, the mixture composition. So the question now, or the, or the challenge, is how to find the best molecules and uh, the appropriate uh, process designs. So for example, the uh, CAS registry currently lists about uh, 265 million molecules that might be uh, interesting. And uh, from that results, uh, on, uh, th uh, 350 uh, times 10 with the power to 14 potential binary mixtures. Yeah, and the challenge is now uh, to find the, the right uh, or the, the most appropriate uh, ones. And 
the best molecules and processes depend on on several aspects and uh, yeah to design these we have to tackle several challenges so it's not only the huge amount of possibilities but it's also the lack of uh, thermophysical properties in particular for mixtures and the only little experience on how the components behave when we use mixture this includes the components like compressors and heat exchangers and the process itself of course but also questions of uh, can we find a lubricant uh, that is uh, uh, compatible with uh, with these uh, refrigerant mixtures and yeah, to tackle this challenge, we have developed an integrated design approach that covers all these aspects. So we design uh, the molecular structure, predict uh, mixture properties, and then design processes and uh, equipment integrated, and finally uh, calculate efficiency or uh, economic metrics. And we can go the chain uh, uh, we can go along the chain from the bottom to the top or we can also formulate as it as an inverse problem where we really optimize molecules and processes with respect to the objective function and uh, of course with respect to uh, thermodynamic and uh, technical constraints and yeah in the project we combine our approach our uh, molecular design approach with the outstanding expertise of, uh, of uh, Eastern Swiss University in, in particular in, in practical aspects of uh, heat pumps and experimental testing. So in the end, we play some kind of, uh, of ping pong in terms of model-based mixture design, then testing, experimental testing, model improvement, again, testing, and finally uh, demonstration of feasibility uh, and the benefits. So together we aim bridging the gap between research and industry towards the faster market introduction of high efficiency heat pumps with temperature glide. And this includes experimental demonstration of the benefits and also clustering of most promising applications and providing a guide that really maps suitable mixtures to applications. But we also take care of uh, how, can be, how can mixtures be handled in practice uh, for example, uh, if there is a, uh, a leakage and, and we lose refrigerant, we have to refill, but we have to know uh, which is the current composition inside the, uh, inside the heat pump. And these are also aspects we cover with our project. And finally, uh, we uh, establish a Swiss Component Center for Industrial Heat Pumps uh, in Buch St. Gallen. Okay, and uh, 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 yeah, to really bridge the gap and get insights on the needs uh, of the industry we have a prominent industrial advisory board uh, comprising partners along the uh, the entire value chain from manufacturers over planners to users okay so now i would like to go to the first uh, results from a model study and uh, from a modeling study and here we uh, yeah we considered uh, many refrigerants, uh, various refrigerants and their mixtures for various uh, uh, conditions of heat sources and sinks. And first, I would like to show one example for uh, the heat source uh, 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 coming in at 60 degrees Celsius and outlet temperature uh, 35. And the sink is uh, heated up from 65 to 100. And this is how the CUPs of the processes look for the different mixtures as a function of molar fraction. So on the left side, you see maybe uh, the CUPs of the pure refrigerant A on, on the right side uh, of the pure refrigerant B and in between uh, the CUPs of the mixture. And what we see is uh, the mixtures achieve significantly different CUPs, but, and that's the uh, first good news, the best CUPs uh, larger than 4.1 are only uh, observed uh, or obtained in for mixtures. And if we analyze the shape here over uh, the molar uh, fraction, we see that these, these uh, CUP curves have totally different shapes. So there are some examples where, uh, where nothing happened 
from or nearly nothing happened uh, from uh, pure A to pure B, or uh, uh, maybe B has a higher CUP than A and uh, the CUP just uh, mon monotonously uh, uh, increases. But we are in particular interested in these kind of shapes here where uh, we find in the mixture a much larger efficiency than uh, the pure fluids have. And there are also some mixtures where we could only uh, use a certain range of molar fraction, for example, uh, because in this area, the vapor pressures are too small or whatever. So if we now uh, look how, uh, if we now look at how it, uh, yeah, how mixtures perform over the entire uh, range of, or over a broad range of heat sources and sinks. And here we uh, consider these cases. So the uh, source always comes in with at 60 degrees and the sink uh, uh, leaves uh, or is heated up to 100, but these temperatures here change. And uh, you can see this, uh, the heat source on the X axis and the sink on the Y axis. And the color code here shows uh, the CUP of the best, best mixture over the CUP of the best pure refrigerant. And what we first of all see is mixtures are always uh, beneficial or at least equally efficient. And we see here uh, in this corner, a maximum CUP increase of 26% at the largest source and sink uh, temperature change, because here is uh, the magic of mixtures that we can tailor the glide to uh, the temperature changes. And uh, yeah, this also shows that we can expect higher improvement if uh, the temperature changes of sink and sources are uh, uh, still larger. Okay, but we, what we also see is opti optimal mixtures are highly specific to source and sink. So this here, the colors of the dots, each color represent another binary mixture of A and B and C and D and so on, uh, but maybe at variable composition. And uh, that means we need another mixture for this point to, to achieve this CUP in, uh, increase uh, compared to this point. And that is, uh, not good for handling in practice because uh, no uh, uh, manufacturer would like to, to have 10 or 20 different refrigerants in their portfolio. And that is why we, uh, we were wondering if we can find mixtures that perform well over the uh, entire range uh, of heat sources and sinks only if we change the composition. And here, uh, again, the, the animation here, the power of, uh, of mixtures and the additional degrees of freedom uh, come into the game. Uh, this plot here shows uh, one all-rounder mixture uh, that we found, and this is one cyclobutane and cyclopropane. And here we see how much the CUP is decreased if we use this mixture compared to the best uh, mixture. And what we see, we only have a small CUP decrease over a wide range. Uh, in uh, The average is minus 4.6%. And yeah, we see, but if uh, uh, we have higher CUP decrease for higher source and, and sink temperatures, but we could also design or find an all-rounder mixture that uh, works uh, quite good in this area. And uh, yeah, what we now see is that one or two maybe binary mixtures enable uh, high efficient processes for many applications just by tailoring uh, the composition. And this uh, enab could, can enable standardization uh, and also cost, uh, cost reduction of high temperature heat pumps. And a pure refrigerant cannot offer this because they have less degrees of freedom and uh, we also identified all round up pure refrigerants for the, the uh, entire uh, range here, uh, but uh, this leads to a CUP decrease of uh, minus around about 12% uh, in average. Okay, so far, I would like to thank you and then uh, I would hand over to my colleague, Leon. Dennis talked about uh, the project, project and introduced it in detail and uh, explain the modeling aspects and the theory of it. Uh, we are here at Eastern Switzerland University of Applied Sciences. 
and we have a long history of uh, conducting experiments in the field of refrigeration, air conditioning, heat pumping. You see some uh, example pictures of experiments that we conducted here. Um, and you see a picture here of the setup that we mainly use for the project. Uh, uh, high temperature heat pumps with high glides that we want to talk today about. And uh, this is a picture on the right hand side of our little plant during construction. You see all the wires hanging around quite wildly. It is perhaps uh, really the heat pump with the most sensors that I'm uh, aware of that I know. We not only have a lot of you know, thermocouples and pressure transducers, but we have also uh, multiple special sensors like density, meters, uh, high quality Coriolis mass transfer, uh, mass flow rate sensors. We have a speed of sound sensor um, and installing even more density meters and other special sensors because we want to really, really understand what these mixtures are doing in our plant. The reason is that nobody has tested such mix such mixtures before us. And with uh, such mixtures, I really mean glides, temperature glides during evaporation and condensation of uh, 30 and 40 Kelvin. Uh, we not only have this little plan, but we also set up a container in which we can test outside because we uh, want to test flammable refrigerants too. So if they uh, leaked out, we have a, an explosion hazard. And that's why we built this little container outside to be all set for any kind of refrigerants and uh, any type of refrigerant mixture. High glide mixtures. So we started out really with a lot of doubts um, whether there would be a COP improvement at all. Uh, many people predicted a composition shift, which would really be not good for our, our goal, our purposes, um, the thermophysical properties of mixtures were a problem because it's unclear whether the current software available can predict those accurately. Um, oil, the compressor at high temperatures at all, whether it survives that or not, because the compressor is not rated for the temperatures that we target. Um, a degraded heat transfer coefficient is also predicted by uh, lots of theoretical studies, but it hasn't been really captured quantitatively um, in, in the open literature. Charging of mixtures was uh, initially a concern, and then also the composition determination. Then, as mentioned, for example, once there's a leak, um, the two components of the mixture may leak at different rates, and after closing the leak, you want to know um, what the composition is inside of the, of the heat pump. I plan to focus on uh, these four points. I don't think I have enough time for them. So we'll, uh, we'll jump a little bit through the presentation and then make sure to leave time for questions and answers. Here you see a chart of the COP, which is kind of the core goal, the core goal of our study to prove that mixtures actually can improve the COP. And to understand the chart, um, look at the y-axis, that is the COP, and the x-axis, that is the VHC, um, volumetric heating capacity. Generally, you could say the larger, the better, or um, the larger, the smaller of a compressor you need. But I just use it here to, to show some data from our mixtures. Now, each uh, line here, for example, the red one, is a binary mixture. And the different points, in this case, stars in the line, are different compositions of that mixture. And you see the mixture in the top. It's R1336MZZZ uh, mixed with R1234YF. So the very right-hand side point is a pure data, pure uh, refrigerant 1234YF. And on the very left-hand side, you have another pure refrigerant, um, the other component of the mixture. And what you can see very clearly, uh, the highest COPs are achieved for the mixtures. In this case, we have an approximately 16% improvement from the pure refrigerant to the best performing mixture. 
and 16 percent is already a lot especially if you consider that we haven't changed any components of the system we haven't changed anything that would increase the investment cost of the system for example we simply uh, put in a different refrigerant or refrigerant mixture in this case As I said, I will jump a little bit over this. Um, well, one one point, I just uh, took this as an example, the green little triangle here. We charged 4,500 grams of one refrigerant and 922 grams of the other refrigerant. Now, that's what we, what we, what we claim to have charged. But then other people come and ask us, are you sure that that's exactly what is in the heat pump? And we needed measurements to actually prove that to them. And here's an example. Uh, you now see data from uh, one data point where we measured the temperature of uh, 66 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 25 bar. And we knew the two components in the system were R32 and R1224YDZ. So using a property uh, calculation software, in this case RefProp, we can calculate the density at these conditions for various mixture compositions. The composition is plotted on the x-axis, density on the y-axis. And um, basically, you can see that this uh, pressure temperature combination as the mixture composition changes is uh, on the vapor side of the dome, within the dome, or in the subcooled liquid region. Um, up here it is in the subcooled liquid region. And when we collected this data point, we also measured the density and we determined that it is approximately uh, 1150 to be precise, uh, 1128 kilograms per cubic meter. So the intersection with the black line would indicate that we have a 0.845 mass fraction. And then we went back and checked what, what had we charged to the system. And in this case, it was a 0.83 mass fraction. And this is just to exemplify that um, what we charge into the system aligns very well with what we uh, measure in terms of property data. Of course, we did this for every single data point we had and for all the mixtures we had. And we used also different methods to uh, determine. So in this chart, which you don't have to understand in detail, we wanted that the, that the colorful dots align with the black lines in the charts. And overall, they do that very well. Um, heat transfer degradation is a phenomenon um, that I try to sketch out here. If you have two different molecules in a pool of liquid, and you start uh, boiling the liquid off, then the more volatile component, in this case, in this case the purple B, will evaporate more quickly. And then after some time, um, B molecules have to tunnel through lots of A molecules. You need to diffuse here um, in order to, to evaporate first, because they are the more volatile component. And this diffusion, actually requires then more energy, more driving potential to make the evaporation process happen. And it causes a lower heat transfer coefficient in the end. Now, the phenomenon is is, is wildly uh, widely known, but nobody can quantify it. And so we just took all our data, plotted a UA value in the y-axis and a mass flow rate on the x-axis and saw a clear trend. But we also saw that there was a second trend in the data showing that when uh, the color is red, meaning we have a low glide in our mixture or no glide, um, then the UA value is generally higher than, we have, than when we have a high glide, as for example, in the purple colors down here. And with this data, we were quite easily able to fit a correlation through all the points. Um, and then use this correlation to predict our evaporation temperatures or our approach temperature differences quite accurately. 
something else I will also jump over. Uh, lastly, compressor wear and tear. So this compressor that you see here in the picture um, really was designed for what we call it normal temperature applications. And we um, torture it a little bit by pushing it to much, much higher temperatures, uh, clearly against the recommendation of the manufacturer. And after having about uh, yeah, accumulated 1,000 operating hours, we opened up the entire compressor, actually together with the manufacturer, with the experts to look inside and see uh, what had changed. And you can see here uh, the cylinder head seal, for example, which had become, uh, yeah, had, had a, <laughs> turned brown on the edges where it's very hot. This is also the only component that really uh, malfunctioned and leaked at some point and had to be replaced. Um, on the other hand, it's not very concerning because this is a part which you can really very easily substitute with, uh, yeah, an identical geometry, but with higher temperature durability. And then there were other signs of the high temperatures, but lots of expectations that actually not come true. For example, there were no signs of oil poking inside the compressor. And then the entire compressor motor and its insulation um, had not experienced any discolorization. And um, Moreover, any uh, wear and tear that we were able to find was not more than from a lower temperature operation would have been expected anyways. So the uh, damaged seal and uh, discolorization are really the most prominent effects of the high temperatures. With that, I would like to conclude. Uh, COP, COP improvements were clearly shown. Uh, we also demonstrated that composition determination um, is successful, actually even across various methods. And then we are working on a heat transfer correlation that captures the effect of the glide. Uh, we don't have the, the measurement accuracy yet that we want, so we're further improving the, the system. And then we'll also come up with an updated correlation. Plus, um, we do, since we do the experiments, also conduct these uh, compressor examinations. Of course, we always have to wait a long time until we have enough operating hours. But it's very insightful and very interesting to open up these uh, compressors after we've used them at very high temperatures. And with that, I would like to conclude. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, open the floor for questions. We, uh, Dennis and I would be very happy to, to answer them. Thank you.